it's time for us to check back in with a people and their quilt. If you missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. Emma Brogdon, The Tennessee River and Quilts. After transcribing many tapes from interviews I had done with colorful mountain quilters, my secretary, Janice Stokes, suggested that I talk with her great aunt, Emma. I kept delaying, but she kept bringing the subject to my attention and telling me I would miss a good interview if I didn't go. One beautiful sunny afternoon in April, we finally drove down to see Miss Emma, as she is known to many hundreds of her former students. What we found was a story that was most interesting and quite typical of rural homesteads from throughout the country. An understanding of this family, its history, and its relationship to quilts and quilting gives an insight into and a perspective of quilting generally. After leaving Interstate 75 near Loudoun, we followed the historic Tennessee River through tall trees and alongside old fields for a few miles. When the meandering little country road ended, we had reached the home of Emma Brogdon. She was expecting us and had hot coffee and sweet potato pie ready. A resolute woman of 82, she was also warm and friendly. She has lived alone since her mother died in 1963. She was never married and spent over 40 years as a teacher and principal in the rural schools of that area. The name of the community, embracing a large geographic area, is Paint Rock. This name was derived, Miss Emma explained, from the variously colored or painted rock cliffs directly across the river from her house. Within minutes after our arrival, we were in a large upstairs closet looking at stacks of old quilts folded and placed neatly on the shelves. But they weren't just old quilts, they were little bits of family, each having its own story and each evoking fond memories of the past. The quilts had been made by Emma's mother, Hazel Miller Brogdon. We asked Emma to discuss her family, her recollections of her mother, especially as it might relate to her quilting. Well, when my mother was nine years old, her mother died, and since mother was the oldest girl in the family, she had to do all the cooking and housework. She had to teach herself everything. She said she often wondered how Grandpa Miller had bragged on the cooking that she did. When she looked back after she had learned to cook, she said that he would sit down and just eat anything that she had on the table and brag on it. She knew after she got older that it wasn't always good, nor always cooked right, but he bragged on it anyway. She certainly was, well, I'll just say, she was on her own. When she started cooking, she had to stand on a box to make her tall enough to wash dishes. There were four children of the first set that she had to take care of. Grandpa Miller married the second time and had four more children. I asked Emma how her mother learned to quilt, the type material she used, and when she did most of the quilt work. She taught herself. At night, she'd piece quilts, and she raised her own cotton. She'd plant the cotton, and those of us big enough to help work in the garden would help pick it. Then during the winter, at night, she'd string out some of that cotton in front of the fireplace and get it good and warm, and you could take the seeds out of it easy if it was good and warm. She knew how to use those cards that you card the little bats to put in the quilts, just about so long and so wide. And she put that cotton on those cards and give it a few licks and then take and rake it off backwards. She'd have those little bats stacked up in an extra chair that she'd put it in. She did most of her quilting of a night and in the wintertime. She had a frame that hung from the ceiling that she kept in the family room, but in later years, she had a frame on horses. She had seven children and raised five of us. My oldest sister was interested in quilting, but I always wanted to be outside. Maud, my sister, was a good hand to sew. She took after mother. She won several blue ribbons with her sewing at the fair in Knoxville. Maud is Janice's grandmother, Mrs. W.A. Uncle Bud Johnson of Kingston. She used to quill out in the garage in the summertime with the doors open so she could see the people passing and what was going on downtown. Back then, Mother didn't have any money, and she'd use quilts to give for wedding presents or if someone's house burned and really needed help, you know, she'd give them a quilt. Sometimes she'd give a quilt to the preacher. I asked Emma if she ever heard of a pounding for the preacher. 
Oh yes, we'd have poundings. A pounding is when you do something extra for the pasture, she explained to Janice, who had never heard of a pounding. They'd ask us to bring a pound of something, beans, sugar, rice, butter, meat, and sometimes it would be a quilt or anything they could use. I don't think she ever sold a quilt. She'd give them away, like I said, and she gave all the kids quilts when they got married, enough for one bed and usually enough quilts for two beds. And she had quiltings quite a lot. Maybe seven or eight women would come when she had a quilt up and eat dinner and have the best time. She'd send word at church or through the children that were in school, send word by the children for their mothers to come and attend a quilting on a certain day, and they'd talk and laugh just like young people. They could make a lot of noise sometimes telling jokes. When you wanted to have a quilting, just send word to the different families. They'd come early and stay till after dinner, and they weren't particular what they ate. It was just an old-timey dinner. They had a good time. I'd be here and wash dishes and look after the dinner and do things like that, but I never did like to quilt. Like I said, she mostly quilted at night when it was too bad to work outside. Back then, we pulled the leaves off the corn stalks for fodder, they called it, and she would work until time to get something for dinner, then fix dinner and go back in the afternoon and help. Sometimes they would have peas in the corn, the ones that made vines, and pick peas and hull them out. She was good at needlework, and she learned to sew and make the nicest dresses and coat suits. She made coat suits for people in the community. She'd take their measurements, you see, she didn't learn it in school, and she didn't have a mother to teach her because her mother died when she was nine years old, and that's what I call learning it on your own. The Tennessee River has always been an important part of the life of the Brogdon family. The building of Watts Bar Dam widened the river considerably, but it still looked more like a river than a lake. I asked Emma about her recollections of the majestic stream. When Watts Bar Dam was built, it covered the level bottom next to the river. It was just as level and rich, and my daddy was the proudest of that 20 acres because it was such rich soil and so easy to work. And when the dam was built, of course it covered it up. Back in the days when my daddy first bought this farm, the men would raise corn and wheat, and they'd have the thresher come thresh the wheat. Back then, the steamboats would carry the wheat and corn to market. They knew the days that the boat would make the trip, and they'd take the wagons and haul the wheat and corn down to the boat. Lots of times when we knew the boat was to come for whatever needed to be shipped, we'd all go down, kid-like, you know, and sit there where we could see them carry the grain on. Another thing that I remember about the boats on the river, our mother had her dentures made when I was about eight years old. Back then, you could ride the boats if you wanted to go to Loudoun or Knoxville. You could go down there and get on the boat and pay so much and ride. So when Mother went to have her dentures made, we spent the night in Loudoun and she took us with her. Captain Dyke on this boat that made the regular trip was just crazy about children and he took us up in the cabin, pilot house, and he had a wooden box and he turned that box down and told me to get up there and help him with that big wheel. That tickled me to death. I got up on that box and held that wheel that guides the boat and he let me blow the whistle. And I just had the biggest tale to tell when I got back off that trip. This typical Victorian crazy quilt held by Blanche and Carl Epperson was made by Carl's mother, Rebecca Bevins Epperson. She embroidered the initials of her mother-in-law, Lucinda Epperson, her father-in-law, Joseph Epperson, and the initials of her children. Carl and Blanche Epperson are shown with two of the quilts which were packed away in the upstairs of the ancestral Epperson home shown in the background. The quilt at left was made by Blanche when she was a teenager in Pattonsville, Virginia. She wanted to make a quilt, she said, that all her friends and neighbors could help with, so she decided to make it with all different pieces. She sent pieces of scraps to all her friends, who in turn sent pieces of their own from which she made the quilt. 
There are no two pieces alike, Blanche said. I made it when I was 18 years old, and we started using it soon after we were married, and we've used it pretty much all these years until the past few years when we got these electric blankets. I washed it too, washed it a lot, and most of the time in lye soap. Lye soap don't hurt a quilt if the soap's made right. The quilt shown on the right was made by either Carl's mother or his grandmother. Carl and Blanche agree that it was in the old home when they were married, but beyond that, they have little knowledge of its origin. The Eppersons of Dry Valley, Scott County, Virginia. Dry Valley is narrow, hilly, and rocky, but it is picturesque and produces a little tobacco, a few stock cattle, and some of the finest folk I've ever known, including Carl and Blanche Epperson. Considering the scant farmland and rough terrain, one wonders how it spawned and sustained such a stately and well-kept home as the Eppersons. I asked Carl about the old home place and how it came to be. Well, my grandparents, Joseph Epperson and his wife, Lucinda, come in here and homesteaded this land. He come over around Church Hill, I always heard it said, he was a soldier in the Civil War. I think they lived in a log house for a while before they built this one. The date on one of the chimney rocks is 1862, and I reckon that is the year the house was built. My grandparents lived here all their lives, and my father was born here and lived all his life here. I was born and raised here and have lived all my life here. I worked for Mason and Dixon Freight Lines for 31 years over here at Kingsport. It was started there by old G.W. King. He was president of the company, but it was just a little outfit then. There were only 20 or 30 men working there then, and now there's thousands all over the country. When I asked Blanche about quilts, she became more interested in the conversation. She told me that there were several old quilts upstairs and that I was welcome to come with her to see what all is up there. We found numerous wall shelves filled with quilts, neatly packed and covered with bed sheets to protect them from dust and insects. Many of these quilts were made by Blanche, but some were made by the Epperson family who lived there before she and Carl were married. Out of about 30 quilts, we chose three to be photographed. The old Epperson home place in Dry Valley, Scott County, Virginia, is little changed from the time it was built 125 years ago by Carl's grandparents. Carl hoes his English peas in the same garden which was tended by his parents and his grandparents. This photograph of Joseph and Lucinda Epperson, Carl's grandparents, still hangs in the dining room. The Rucker Home Place Frank Rucker and his wife Lenore live across the road from his ancestral home a few miles above Rutledge, Tennessee, the county seat of Granger County. By Tennessee standards, the valley in which they live is considered wide and fertile. It has been home for the Ruckers since pioneer times. The original home place was burned during the Civil War, but soon afterward, a large and imposing structure was built which has accommodated the Rucker family until the present day. Since his retirement, Frank has operated a 200-acre cattle farm and has mastered the art of making split white oak baskets. During a visit with the Ruckers, I asked about old quilts and was invited into one of the bedrooms where Lenore brought out a number of interesting quilts, explaining as she did so the background of each. The Ruckers are shown here at the family home place with a quilt made by Frank's great-grandmother, Moore, photographed by the author. Rufus Graves and Quilts for 26 Children Rufus Graves was a descendant of one of the early pioneer families of Union County, Tennessee. Married twice, he had 13 children by each of his two wives. I knew his second wife and most of the 26 children, including Luther and Grant, with whom the second Mrs. Graves made her home until her death. After Norris Dam was built and the Graves left their ancestral home, they moved to neighboring Knox County where many of the brothers and sisters bought little pieces of land, built their modest homes, and spent their last days. They were among the most unselfish, neighborly, and honest people I've ever known, and they were colorful. As a child, I remember visiting Scott, one of the older boys, 
He lived in a single room, which was heated by a stove, and I remember that he emptied the ashes beside the stove all winter until the pile of ashes was nearly as high as the stove itself. Grant, who was a big fleshy fellow, wore a felt hat, two or three handkerchiefs around his neck, and a big red bandana over his face with only his eyes peering out. <coughs> He supposedly suffered from some type of sinus condition, and the direct breathing of cold or cool air further aggravated his problem. He drove a Model A Ford, which pulled a tiny trailer, and he drove over the county buying veal calves to resell on the Knoxville market. On Sunday, he would drive my grandfather and grandmother Rice to visit us or other relatives. Luther was and is a tinkerer. He plays the guitar and fiddle, makes a little garden, repairs lawnmowers, and most anything else, and cuts hair. He never charges for his barbering. When I asked Luther about old quilts, his eyes brightened. Why, Mommy had all kinds of old quilts, had to have a lot of bad kiver back then, or we'd froze to death. Yeah, most of them is piled up out there in Grant's little house. Been planning on hauling them off. They're all wore out. Of course, they make good dog beds, and they're good to cover up things with. Stacked on the floor in the corner of Grant's two-room house were 43 old quilts. Nearby was Grant's little camelback trunk containing almost all the worldly possessions he had when he died. There were photographs of him as a young man when he worked up north, packets of faded letters from the girls he once knew, his razor, glasses, and several big red handkerchiefs. There was another trunk nearby which had belonged to their mother. Luther opened it and started looking through its contents. Lord, these things have been packed away in here since four mommy died. Looky here, old quilt pieces. She saved ever scrap for making quilts. And so it was that virtually the only thing this mother of 13 left behind was a stack of old quilts and a trunk containing material for making others. There was no show quilts here, no lightweight applique floral designs to be packed away in chests for posterity. These quilts were made from old clothing and from cloth scraps left from making new clothes. They were heavily worn and some had been patched, patch on top of worn patch. There was one brightly colored Victorian type crazy quilt and I was deeply moved when I saw it. Even though it must have been a constant struggle for the mother and girls to maintain enough quilts for the large family, as well as attending to all the other household chores, some member of the family strove for what they perceived to be a beautiful and colorful quilt. I can imagine that it was the most colorful and perhaps the most cherished article in the Graves household. Luther Graves is shown with one of the 43 quilts stacked in the back of the Graves home shown here. Well, it took a heap of quilts for a family of 26, Luther said. Shown here are a few of the Rufus Graves quilts. Johnny Harness and his wife are among the very few Americans who still live in log houses of Pioneer Vintage. Theirs is located in Laurel Grove, a community at the foot of Cumberland Mountain in the coal mining region of Anderson County, Tennessee. Although I have known the Harnesses for over a quarter century, I had no idea what type quilts they might have. They were reluctant to show any of them, saying that all they had were just old, everyday, ragged quilts. But after a while, they did bring out the two shown here in the accompanying photograph. They are much used, soft and warm, and patinaed old quilts, plain and conservative. They match precisely, I thought, the neat, rustic old log cabin, which is their home. Immediately across the mountain in Dutch Valley, the level land was much wider, more fertile, and bore little resemblance to Laurel Grove. The quilts, too, as we shall see, were as different as the terrain, the homes, and the lifestyles of the people. The Dutch Valley Quilts Dutch Valley is one of the most interesting and picturesque little valleys in East Tennessee. It stretches roughly from the town of Oliver Springs, northeasterly to Lake City, once called Coal Creek. Towering over this fertile valley is Cumberland Mountain, locally called Walnut Ridge, almost as wild and untamed as when the first settlers came into the region 175 years ago. 
The valley takes its name for the German who settled there about 1799 or 1800. This group of German settlers were led by one Frederick Sadler, a wagon maker from York, Pennsylvania. Sadler came there with his seven German sons-in-law and their families, Shanliver, Bumgardner, Claxton, Claude Felter, Leinart, Lieb, and Spessard. The three homes we visited in Dutch Valley all produced quilts of a superior quality. These were the type of quilts which one would expect to find in the relatively well-to-do home located on large farms. They are not the type usually found in small mountain cabins. However, this postulation does not always hold true. Log cabins may contain beautiful quilts, as has been observed earlier, although they tend to be patchwork rather than applique. A brief visit to these three homes in a late afternoon in March provided some insight into the type quilts this one mountain valley produced and gave some indication as to how the present owners cherished these heirlooms. Helen and Hall Burris, in front of their home, which was built by Helen's grandfather, hold one of the family quilts, the Mexican Rose. The Hall and Helen Burris Place, Dutch Valley. In 1861, Henry P. Farmer sat on a pair of draw bars at what is now called the Burris Place and watched a contingent of Confederate soldiers pass through the valley. One of the troops recognized young Farmer and said to him, We'll be marching back from Clinton tomorrow and we'll be expecting you to go with us. Henry knew that this was no idle invitation and that he would have no choice but to join the troops when they returned. But his sympathy lay with the Union and he took to the mountains and persuaded other young men to join him. They walked to the famous Cumberland Gap where they joined the Union Army. Henry enlisted as a private and was mustered out at the end of the war as a lieutenant. He came home to Dutch Valley and soon afterward built the two-story frame house shown here. Helen Burris, who with her husband Hall lives in the house today, is a granddaughter of Henry Farmer. She is also a descendant of the Duncans, whose ancestral home was also in Dutch Valley. The numerous quilts which Helen owns were made by these two old Dutch Valley families, the Farmers and the Duncans. Although Helen cherishes them very much, she doesn't know which quilts belong to which family. The spring sun is good for quilts as well as the beagle. These three are among the several ancestral quilts Helen Burris laid out for us to view. The Old Fowler Place Perhaps the most historic house in Dutch Valley is the Old Fowler Home. It was built in the early 1800s by the Edwards family out of brick made only a hundred yards from the house site. Samuel Fowler bought the place in 1901 and it came to be known as the Fowler Place. It is listed in the National Register of Historic Places as the Edwards Fowler Home. When I told Sam, son of Samuel, and his wife Bertha of my interest in old quilts, Bertha chose a feathered star to show us. There were many more packed in the upstairs chest, but she thought this one was the most interesting and historic. It was made by Sam's grandmother, Emily Caroline Trotter Robertson, and her sister, Jane Trotter Walker. They were originally from Sevier County, Tennessee. Emily gave the quilt to her daughter, Mary Lee Robertson Fowler, and upon her death, it fell to Sam. Bertha recalls that her mother-in-law would often unpack the quilt and show it, but that she never used it. Sam and Bertha Fowler hold the feather star quilt made by Sam's grandmother and stored in the old Fowler house shown in the background. Emily Caroline Trotter Robertson, who made the feathered star quilt in the late 1800s, photographed courtesy of Sam and Bertha Fowler. Hmm. We'll stop right there for today. Very interesting part of the book. Uh, wonderful to see those old quilts and uh, hear a little bit about the stories of the people uh, that owned them for their collection. Makes me wish that I could go back and have seen them, but more than the quilts, I'd just like to have seen the people and talked to them. Now, those one family he talked about was real characters, the one that actually John Rice could remember, the two, Luther and Grant. What uh, interesting characters they seemed like. Let's see, I took some notes. Let me go back to oh, Emma Brogdon, the very first one. Uh, how sad about her mother dying and then the little girl having to take over and do everything, and she didn't really have anything you know anybody to teach her what to do 
but how precious. I just love it that her daddy bragged on her. No matter what she said on the table, he told her it was good. That's just so heart heartwarming. Uh, it makes me get teary-eyed. I think all kids need that encouragement and to be bragged on, as we would say, it. and definitely in that situation when she was trying her best to fill, fill the mother's shoes. Can you just imagine a nine years old, nine year old? I could not, when I was nine years old, I couldn't have done nothing like that, I don't think. I guess we don't know what we're capable of, though, till we have to, have to do it. But that was just so, so sweet, so sweet. Now, her mother learned how to quilt, though, go on and then to raise a family, and uh, wonderful the way that Emma Emma remembered her and the, the way that she talked about her. You could tell how much that she really respected her. I like the part about poundings. If you've never heard of a pounding, it's exactly like what John Rice described. And um, in my area, I've heard people talk about them. Not really, nobody does it as much today in my area, although people have, when I've talked about it before, people have said they do still in their area. But I have to share a just really sweet story that I only learned in the last few years that Granny told me. She told me that um, one time when her and Pap was, you know, they was first married, and I'm not sure if they hadn't, I guess they did have me, me and Steve, probably not Paul, and we didn't live here in Wilson Hall, or we lived over at Sherlock, so it was either they already had me, or it was right before they had me, because that's, I lived there when I was uh, real little. Anyway, they were going to a church down the road here, and Maggie's Chapel, and her and Pap was attending church there, and they were trying to, it was a very old church. I actually have a video about it, so I'll link to that video so you can see it. But they were going there, and the church was trying to raise money because they were going to uh, improve the church. You know, they were going to try to improve the church. And she said, before I knew what happened, your daddy gave them his whole paycheck, every bit of it, his whole paycheck. And she said, I thought, oh my goodness, Jerry, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? You know, how are we going to get groceries? And she said, I was just so worried. But she said, I knew, you know, I, he had to do what he felt like he was supposed to do. So he'd give him his whole paycheck. But she said, we left church and we went home and I was just worrying myself to death about it. Worrying my head off, Granny said. What was we going to do? And he, she said they hadn't been home long. And then my mama and papa, Wilson, Pap's parents, they come to visit them. Well, they come to visit them, but they also, Papa Wade was a preacher, kind of mentioned that about the preachers in there getting the poundings. And he had started pastoring a new church, and that church had blessed them with a pounding. They had done that. They blessed them with a pounding. And Mama and Papa, probably because they knew Mom and Daddy, Granny and Pap was having it hard, they wanted to share with them. So they brought by some of the pounding and was visiting with uh, Granny and Pap, but also wanted to share. So... Mama said that was, um, Granny said that um, that was the Lord's way of telling her, Luzine, I'm worried, you, don't you worry. You let Jerry do what he needs to do, you know. Anyway, that was a real sweet story, and I'm so glad Granny shared it with me because I didn't know, I would have never knew that. I mean, I knew that Pap was very given, but I'd never heard that story that he gave his whole paycheck. Um, Epperson's. The Epperson's were the uh, car. Let's see. I'm going to have to go back. I've wrote down. I do that to myself. I write down something. And I'm like, what did I mean by that? I wrote down Epperson's and Carl. Oh, I know what it was now. As soon as I opened the book, I remember. What an amazing history there. His grandfather lived in that house until he was grown. Had his, his father. He lived in that house till he was grown. Of course, he had him, had Carl, and then Carl lived in that house till he was grown. Isn't that amazing, that history? What history to be three generations like that? Now, I've certainly not, um, you know, it is, even today's world, it is kind of strange. Like Corey and Katie, well, now Corey's married and moved with Austin, but like their whole life, they lived in the same house. They come home from the hospital to this house, and this is where they live. So that's kind of rare. Like in my lifetime, I lived in two houses. I lived at Sherlock's just over in Martin's Creek, and then I lived in Pap and Granny's house. I mean, growing up, and then, of course, I moved up here. Um, and I lived just a small amount of time in Haywood County with me and Matt and Matt, but I don't really even count that because it was more like I knew that I wouldn't stay there. So interesting, though, that longevity of that house and the uh, people living there. Now, I can say, as far as just this area, Wilson Holler, so Benjamin, that would have been Pap's grandfather, my great-grandfather, he lived here. His son, Wade, which was Pap's father, lived here in Wilson Holler. Pap lived here in Wilson Holler, and then here I am living in Wilson Holler, and my children are living in Wilson Holler, and 
I'll get teary-eyed thinking about it. I'm about to have grandsons who are going to live in Wilson Holler. So that is longevity there, but not all in the not in the same house. And then the Rufus uh, Graves, I think it was Rufus, or maybe it was just Rufus. Yeah, it was Rufus Graves. That How amazing to have 13 kids. He, he married and had 13 kids. I guess she died. He married again, and he had 13 more kids. Can you imagine? 26 kids. Now, there's two families in my area, not today, not currently, but um, I guess a different generation is what I'm trying to say, more like Pat's generation that had big families like that. The Cook family, Miss Cook, and I can remember her, and then the Chastain family, and I can also remember her, Granny Chastain. I can just barely remember her. She was a little bitty woman, but had big families like that. But um, I, I think the Chastains was all one family, was like over 20, like maybe two sets of twins. But then the Cook family was like kind of, there was um, some kids from the first wife like that, and she died, and then the rest, though, were Granny Cooks. And I can't remember off the top of my head how many were hers and how many was the first ones. But still, <clears throat> those big families with 20, can you just imagine, 20 kids. Um, and I remember Granny Cook uh, very well, and she's very sweet and very, you know, healthy and strong. And Granny Chastine was too, when I think about her. Uh, anyway, amazing, amazing to have that many kids. I just can't even, can't even fathom and imagine. Uh, and then it was really interesting, the Dutch Valley, really beautiful quilts there at the end, that last part. And, of course, he's talking about that that was more of a fertile land. And so then, you know, just because of that very nature in those days, you're going to probably be more prosperous because you can raise more, whether you're selling it or even just for your family, than on those kind of hard scrabble farms like on the side of a goat bluff like me and Matt. Um, it would be, be different for sure. But those were really, really beautiful quilts. Um, it is sad that she couldn't tell she knew they come from her family that the very last one we spoke of that he wrote of and we spoke to feels like we spoke to him don't it but she couldn't tell which family which side of her family they come from but she just knew that they were her family her family's quilts that really speaks to that we all should we think that uh, for one thing we think i think sometimes that people won't care and then we also think, oh, I got time for that. But you don't always. We should always write down <laughs> who made what. And like thinks makes me think of pictures. You got to write on the pictures who they are because one generation later, nobody remembers. That was Uncle, Sa Uncle um, Sal. He had uh, two daughters by a lady that never lived here, and they'd come visit him. And that was, you know, that was them. That was his his daughters that you don't nobody remembers because they only come once or twice because they lived in California. Um, and then before you know it, nobody even well, who are those people? I don't know who those are, so we might as well just throw that picture away. You know, anyway important for us to write down things for for people and i need to take that advice uh my own self i used to be really good about writing stuff down but not so much anymore so i need to do that i hope you enjoyed this part of the book and i hope you'll leave a comment and tell me what jumped out at you what parts you liked the best and i hope you drop back by next friday so we see who john rice talks to next <music>